Hi everybody, this is Dr. Peterson. This is my second pre-lab lecture about the determination of absolute zero. I just ate lunch. I'm sitting here with my wife. You want to say hi, Leah? Hi, Leah. <laughs> there you go. Uh, you can read about the objectives of the lab there, but we're going to learn about gas laws. And specifically, you'll make an experimental measurement of absolute zero. Gas laws. My wife is still laughing. She thinks this is really funny. All right. There are a number of gas laws, but the one we're talking about today is Charles's law. Charles's law tells us that the volume of a gas varies linearly with temperature, provided that pressure is constant. Um, so you can see that here. Let's see if I can get my pointer to work. Uh, 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 highlighter. Good. So um, I'm plotting over here the volume of the gas versus temperature. And you can see that it is a straight line which goes through, um, what's well, a straight line? It doesn't go through zero, but it's a straight line. And it will turn out that um, Charles's law holds regardless of the temperature scale that you use, um, or I'm showing you now uh, volume measurements at different pressures. So the one that we just looked at was one atmosphere. Uh, we see that that's a straight line shown here. But if you look at half an atmosphere of pressure, you get a um, slightly different straight line, two atmospheres of pressure. Um, end of the day, it's always a straight line, although we can see the slope and intercept change. So the question is, why does this happen? And as you can see, Charles was working sort of before we had a, a real strong notion of atoms and molecules. He wasn't exactly sure why. I think the intuition today is a lot simpler. We recognize that temperature is really a measurement of the average molecular speed, right? So when I say a gas is at a higher temperature, I have some intuitive notion that the molecules in that gas are moving faster. And at higher temperatures, we would expect the molecules to move faster. When they move faster, they're gonna push harder on the walls and expand the volume. I was just showing you the volume expanding with my hand, but I realized in an audio recording that's not doing you much good. At any rate, this allows us to ask some more interesting questions. And specifically, uh, you might wonder about how much faster the molecules move. So the question that you see is here, and I'm gonna switch this thing up again. Uh, pointer options, laser pointer. Here's, here's the, the question I wanna ask. At 100 degrees C, do molecules move faster um, specifically 10 times faster than they do at 10 degrees Celsius. And you may or may not have some intuition about that. Um, what Charles started to think about was really how you might think about this in terms of the volume of a gas. So uh, in order to make this sort of absolute comparison to say that they're moving 10 times faster, you could extrapolate and think about, well, what's the, the volume at which, sorry, what's the temperature at which the volume of a gas is zero, right? So Charles' law tells us that volume is proportional to temperature, but what defines that zero of temperature? And when you think about this theoretical situation where a gas would have no volume, what you're really thinking about in a Charles's law plot is the x-intercept, right? I gotta get my cursor off here. Hang on a second. Uh, pointer. I'm gonna go pen. If you do that, um, and you take your Charles Law plots and you extrapolate them backwards to zero, you'll find out that they all have something which is uh, about the exact same intercept. And this intercept is what today we know is absolute zero, right? Um, absolute zero is something that we typically measure on something called the Kelvin scale. And specifically, the way you measure temperature on a Kelvin scale is given with this formula. So I take the temperature in degrees Celsius and you add to it 273.15. Ultimately, the Kelvin scale is important because it allows us to compare thermal energies at different temperatures. And now we can actually go through and answer this question um, that 
I had originally asked, right? Does a gas have 10 times more energy at 100 degrees Celsius than 10 degrees Celsius? The way you would do that was you'd look at the ratio of these two temperatures. So T2 is 100 degrees Celsius, T1 is 10 degrees Celsius. If I convert those to Kelvin temperatures, you add 273 to each. Uh, 100 turns into 373, 10 degrees Celsius turns into 283 Kelvin. And if I look at the ratio of those two numbers, I just covered it over, but what you would ultimately see is that there's 30% more thermal energy at 100 degrees Celsius compared to 10 degrees Celsius. And that might make a little bit more sense to you or at least seem a little more reasonable. All right, that's my back. Um, this is the lab that you would have been doing today. What you uh, would have done would have been to take a big beaker, fill it up with water, take a graduated cylinder and invert it and stick it inside of this bath, right? That's shown here. So here's my inverted uh, graduated cylinder inside of the temperature bath. And all you would simply do is heat this thing up and measure the volume, right? The volume as a function of temperature. You could use that data to generate a Charles Law plot and determine absolute zero. One catch though, and this is where it gets a little trickier. Uh, so uh, imagine two different temperatures. This is at some cold temperature. This is at some hot temperature. In addition to the air that exists in the graduated cylinder, so imagine this is my inverted graduated cylinder. There's water down here. Right? There's air above it up here, but there's also water vapor. And the question is, how does the amount of water vapor compare when the temperature is hot compared to when the temperature is cold? And I'm gonna switch my pointer color if I can do this correctly. Uh, screen, pointer options, paint color. What you might guess is that if I went to some high temperature, there would be a lot more water vapor at a high temperature compared to a low temperature. And this creates a problem. Um, this is actually another one of the gas laws called Avogadro's law, right? I have more molecules when it's hot compared to when it's cold, and I gotta account for that increase in the amount of water vapor. Um, so here's how we do it. Uh, essentially, we use another really common gas law called Dalton's law of partial pressures. It's expressed here, and I'll give you some details um, a little bit later, but I can think of the total pressure in this system as being composed of two components. One from the pressure of air, and I'm gonna switch my pointer color again, pink color, red, all right? And one from the vapor pressure of water. This vapor pressure of water is a tabulated value. It's one that you can look up in the laboratory manual. P total is a constant. It's atmospheric pressure on a given day. And uh, if this is something I could look up, right? Pressure total is a constant, I could calculate P air. Once I have the partial pressure of air, um, I can use another gas law, a version of Boyle's law, which would tell me that the volume that this air would occupy is given by the ratio of P air to P total times volume total. So if you think about this, uh, if the partial pressure of water, the vapor pressure of water were really low, P air would be approximately equal to P total. If P air is approximately equal to P total, this ratio would be one. Um, here's how we're actually going to do today's lab. What you are going to be given on the report sheet is representative V gas versus temp data from a previous 119 student. So this is from the report sheet that you're going to download. Um, you'll see this sort of dummy data placed into that file. And I meant right here, this is student data.
stu student data, that's what that says. Once you have that dummy data, all you're gonna do is analyze it as if you had obtained it. And so there's really three components here. There's three columns that you have to fill out. Um, the first is this partial pressure of water, the vapor pressure of water. This is a quantity that you can look up in the lab manual. One challenge um, that you're gonna have to figure out is that these temperature measurements are in general made at non-integer values. So you'll see this is at 64.6 degrees, not 65. And um, what that means is you're going to have to interpolate for the non-integer values. Uh, if you're not sure how to do that, look in your lab manual. Uh, in the beginning of it, there are some directions on interpolating. Uh, you can also get in touch with me or Cassie, and we can help you figure out how to do that. Once you have the partial pressure of water, the vapor pressure of water, you're going to use this equation to calculate um, that should say P air, it says pair, but it's the partial pressure of air. And once you have the partial pressure of air, then you can use Dalton's law of partial pressures in order to calculate V air, right? Um, so first two columns are the simulated measured data. Middle column, you look up in your lab manual with the notation that you're gonna interpolate. And then the last two are things that you calculate. Once you have all of that data, you will generate a Charles Law plot, V air versus temperature. You will determine absolute zero from a graphical analysis of that data. So you're going to fit it to a straight line, extrapolate it backwards until the Y intercept is zero and back out what absolute zero is. You'll also note that the report sheet is going to ask you to calculate the number of moles of air in the sample. And if you're not sure how to think about that, um, I would advise you to think about the ideal gas law. That would be a useful way to start to get some of this information. Um, no waste down the drain today. Haha, -ha, that's a joke. Uh, submission will be the same as the other ones. You want to download the Word version of the uh, report sheet, enter in your data, and then submit it via the Canvas Dropbox. Again, all these assignments are due on Friday, April 17th, 11.59 uh, p.m. If you have any questions or concerns, please contact me as soon as possible. Really happy to help in any way that I can. That's what I got for you. Uh, enjoy the lab. It's a good experiment. And uh, hopefully we'll see you guys soon. All right. Hope all's well. Bye.